My name is Melissa Jeter, Librarian Specialist for the Art Tatum African American Resource Center, located in the Kent Branch of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Welcome to the Art Tatum African American Resource Center's Oral History Project, the Adrienne Cole Collection. Dr. Adrienne Cole was a local African American historian and educator who began collecting the stories of noteworthy Toledoans in the African American community. With this oral history project, the Art Tatum African American Resource Center honors her memory and her work. Join me and University of Toledo Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Willie McCather, as Toledo's very own African Americans share the stories of their lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Willie McCather. In this segment, we're pleased to welcome Reverend Dr. John E. Roberts, pastor of the Indiana Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. Pastor Roberts, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank um, you. Pastor Roberts, I'd like to ask you a, a number of questions about your life here in Toledo. But before doing so, I'd like to sort of go back and talk about your life prior to you um, getting into the ministry and um, your involvement with, it, with um, Toledo. So let's go back. I know that you were born um, in 1927 in Bryant, Mississippi. Yes. What was life like for you growing up in Mississippi? Well, it, it was very well. I, I thought it was. Uh, during the uh, Depression, I think that's what they call it. Oh, yeah. Those uh, tough years. Yeah. But I, we had things that uh, seemed that others didn't have. In fact, I thought my grandfather had money. Okay. Uh, he, he looked out for us. Looked out for you. Yeah. Okay, and what kind of work did your grandfather do? Uh, he was a farmer. He had been working on the railroad. I didn't know a lot about that, but he really farmed. And I was sitting here thinking, uh, I think you farm uh, sharecropper and on half. I guess. I, I, I'm not for sure now. Okay, okay. So if he was a sharecropper, that meant at some point he shared some of his crops, maybe if it was cotton, for example, right. with the owner of the property. Right. And at some point you had to go in um, um, and see, see if it broke even or not. Oh. Uh, at settle-up time. Well, uh, he didn't, he didn't, de maybe it wasn't shared in. Uh, he, he didn't have to go see whether he broke even now uh, it wasn't tough like that okay. he uh they got so much of what uh th th we made but uh he didn't run into that part of uh you just made it and okay. broke even uh he, he got his share he got his share oh yes okay, okay. he did well okay he had some good people that uh, own the place. Own the property. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, what was race relations like in, in Mississippi when you were growing up? Well, to me, uh, it, was, it wasn't that bad. It's a few things that I remember that uh, it was a no-no. And, uh, but I really didn't get there real side of it until I came here. But when I was there, uh, my grandfather was one of those people that, uh, let me see, don't fool with him. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, okay. those saying is, uh, don't bother him. That means he don't take no stuff. Okay. There's another word for it okay. well, that, that they used. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so, what did he call you growing up? Uh, preacher. Preacher. Yeah. He called me preacher unless he's upset with me. And I wasn't a type to want him to get upset with me, so he called me preacher called most preacher. all the time. Okay. okay. So, now, how about school? Did, did, um, did you attend school in, oh, in, in Bryant? Oh, yes. Uh, we was, he didn't have uh, uh much education. I can't remember whether he had any at all, but he wanted to make sure that I got some okay. and my sister. Uh, we took and we went to school and if farming interfered 
we would make it up. It, it, would, be, it would be very little interference from, uh, you know, from going to the field okay. because they tried to work it that way. They might get someone else to help them because they wanted us to get an education. Okay. Uh, so. In fact, he loved to uh, have somebody around when he had to deal with uh, counting and money. Okay. Um, and was that person you? Well, yes. He had a son uh, that uh, used to be around, but he, he, he'd rather have me. Uh, you know, uh, okay. uh, his son, he's kind of, uh, you know, he was older and he okay. had got the age where he wanted to do his thing. And, okay. and he just liked to have me around. And like we go to uh, the gin town to gin cotton and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, once they bail it up you'd ask for uh, the man to come and says uh, uh, Mr. Dudley and you, they call him Mr. you know he must have been okay <laughs> 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 and he says uh, y your bail came to so much thus and so and uh, he'd said Preacher, what did you get? And I said, uh, he said, well, well, maybe a preacher made a mistake. That's what he'd tell the gentleman. And he said, well, let me go back and check. Mm -hmm. And he come back. He said, you know that boy's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did that a lot. Did that a lot. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it sounds as if then your grandfather stood his own. The reason why I say that, yeah. I know with some people who are from the South, if they question the accounting of a white person, they'd be in big trouble. Right. But that wasn't the case with your grandfather. No, no. See, uh, Mr. Harden, who, that's the plantation we was on, mm -hmm. uh, he was strong too. And he didn't allow nobody to uh, mess with his uh, people who stayed on his farm. He, okay. he, they didn't fool with him either. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, and they were friends of uh, those who, uh, I, I remember, uh, I can't even think of the name now, but uh, they lived uh, at Torrance. Uh, one would ride a motorcycle, and uh, he was coming to Memphis one day, and uh, he was running a 100 miles an hour in a 50 mile zone, and, wow. and the police stopped him, and he said, well, that's $50. And uh, he said, well, you might as well take a hundred. <laughs> he said, why do you want me to take a hundred? He said, because I'm, I'm uh, coming back just like I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and they took the hundred dollars, and he did. Is uh, that right? They, yeah. It, it, there were those who, they didn't bother. They didn't bother. Yeah, and my grandfather just happened to be close to them. Okay. So that worked out well for you then? Kind of, sort of. Okay, okay. Good. Now, yeah. so there come a point where you left Bryant. Um, yeah. When did you leave and where did you go? Well, uh, my grandfather passed okay. and uh, we came to Toledo. Okay. Uh, my mother and my stepfather had moved here, uh, I think a few years before that. Okay. And uh, we came up here. Uh, in fact, I had the shock of my life because I thought that grandfather had money <laughs> because he always what we really wanted, he just about could, he'd get it. In fact, I had a new bike, and nobody around there had no new bike, not even the whites. So, okay. Uh, and uh, when we came here, we really didn't have fare. Really? Yeah, we had to sell uh, some of the uh, livestock and some of the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, See, we we own our things, okay, uh, uh, and for farming and all that. Okay, okay. But when we, we sold some things, and then my sister and I came here, and then laid on my grandmother. Okay. Yeah. Can I, what year was it when you got, arrived at Toledo? Uh, 1944. 1944. Yes. Okay. And how old were you when when you got here? Well, let me see. I was. Uh, Mm, 17. 17? Yes. Okay. So when you got here, 
Um, what kind of work did you start to do right away once you got here? Well, I was going to school. You was going to school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I started to Libby. Okay, so you started at Libby. Right. Okay. And I tried to, uh, my mother tried to uh, work it because our stepfather was there, but he, uh, he, he left, so uh, okay. then mother couldn't, uh, uh, she couldn't take care of uh, my sister and myself and herself. Okay. Yeah, you know, and so then I started working part-time and going to school. Okay. okay. And uh, they had a, a lineup, well, the buses lined up at mid, 12 o'clock at night, and uh, I was downtown in Walgreens, and, and uh, I couldn't get off in time to catch the bus, even though uh, the, the drugstore closed at 11 o'clock. Okay. So, uh, and if I missed the lineup, then there wasn't no more buses for an hour, so okay. I would walk home, mother didn't want me to do it, so I, I had to stop uh, work there. and. Uh, wind up uh, getting a, a full-time job. A full-time job. Yeah, okay. too, okay. because my grandmother came too. Okay, so she then, came later. So then you sort of became the, the man of the house and supporting uh, everybody, helping helping to support your family then. That, that was it. Back in those days, they educated the girl. The boys had to work. Okay. That was the setup. If anybody had to come out of school, it would have to be the young man. The young man. Yeah. Okay. And and that was rough because I needed it. And uh, uh but you know. Well, do you, do you think you may have missed out on some education? Yeah. Of well, yes. I really wanted to be a mechanic. Did you really? Yes. I wanted to go to Macom, and I, I I never could do it. Uh, in fact, I had to. Stop, once I stopped school and I, I went to work at Willis Overland, then uh, I didn't have nobody that I really knew that would in turn teach me the ropes uh, about jobs and uh, once you get laid off when you get called back uh, Willis Overland, they was uh, all they would uh, call you back for is uh, in the, it was machinery, I, I can't think of what they call it now, but anyway, mm -hmm. that's all they, that's all they would call it back, so, and I didn't know that you should, could go in. Okay. And then just, uh, uh well, you know this, well, they're going to teach you anyway. Right. And right. I didn't know that, so, uh, and then I, what I did, I started night school. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, trying to, uh, learn how to. Uh, get things done uh, in school and then try to work too. That wasn't easy. Well, you know what, obviously you got it right because you went on to get your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, and a doctorate degree. So you, you obviously you, you learned pretty quickly. Yeah, well, uh, I found out when we came along, you had to do your best to get a job. The, the trend were you had to be, be the best in whatever you uh, set out to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I sort of minimize it a little, but sure. you, 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 so we grew up uh, saying anything that can be done, uh, if I see it, I can do it. If I see a person do it, I can do it. Right, right. We get that mentality. That means you really pay attention to what's going on. And we did that. But what happened was uh, you get to fooling around with some of the fast company and then you get where you get discouraged. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, but I never wanted to be down and I didn't want nothing to control me that was going to destroy me. Okay. So when I went to deal with people who was dealing with the destroying stuff, I dropped them. Okay. I remember one night we went out 
we I was working at Willis Oval and we we went out and fellas didn't most of them didn't have no money, but they could drink beer all night. That happened one night. <laughs> I had twenty five dollars to wake up the next day and I usually go to Sunday school and church and we just I'm just going home. And what happened was they spent my twenty five dollars. <laughs> and I was upset. And I'm still a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I was through with them. You was through with them in the yeah, end, that's right. I, I did. I didn't move around with them anymore. Is that either. right? No. Okay, no. okay. Let me go. Let me go back. Now, so when you first got here, and as you have been here for a little while, um, compare for me racism between being in Toledo versus being in Mississippi. Well, I, I really. I really wasn't aware of racism in Mississippi as I was when I got here because I mow on my own and my grandfather and my dad also. I never was with my dad that much because I, uh, when I was four years old, he and mother separated. Mm -hmm. But he was the kind that you didn't fool with either. Okay. And uh, And my grandfather and I, we used to, uh, when it would rain and we came out of the field, we would wind up uh, uh, target practicing mm. in the back, and even we would get out and 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 and, and shoot. Uh, he had a rifle, uh, and it was known he had been in service, and he had a rifle that would shoot five miles. Wow! And uh, that was known around. They said, "Well, you don't want." Uh, you don't want Dudley uh, upset with you. So, uh, and he, he taught me how to shoot uh, a gun, a rifle, okay. uh, a pistol, uh, you know, all that. So, uh, so therefore, I never really ran into a lot of, of, uh, of the problem because, and even the whites uh, uh, was close to us. Yeah, we were close to them, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and if you if you have friends there that's white that's uh, don't nobody fool with, then they don't fool with you, and and uh, I know, and I, the kids and I we played together. Did you really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, in fact, other people I've talked to about who had white friends in the South, in particular, mm -hmm. have told me that when those kids became a certain age. Mm -hmm. that you are required to address them as Mr. and Mrs., even though you're the same age as they are. Was that your case? Uh, I guess so. I, I think so. Uh, I think so. Okay. Yeah. I, it wasn't a big issue then. See, uh, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, is one of the things that uh, we grew up on. So therefore, uh, it wasn't hard to to do that. In fact, my children do that. Well, but but I'm talking about for kids. For for uh, kids, for kids yeah. your same age. It's, let's say if you're t if you're eight years old, uh -huh. you got to call your friend who's eight years old, Mr. Johnny, and his sister, uh, Miss Susie. So that so, so in that context, was that required of you growing up in Mississippi? To be totally honest, I can't. I can't necessarily remember. I, I know about the, the grown adults. up, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. But, but the kids, boo. Uh, I'm not for sure. Maybe not. Okay. 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 Let's then come back to to Toledo then. So you're here in Toledo. When you arrived, what church did you start attending when you arrived to Toledo? Oh, uh, let me see. I think I went to Central a little. But I, I went to Calvary Baptist. That's where I really wanted to join. Calvary Baptist. Yes, okay. the old man Dotson. Uh, I, I really wanted to join that, but my parents were at Central Baptist. Okay. And uh, uh, that's where they started taking us. And that was 1944, so. Okay, okay. Um, at what point did you either hear the calling for the ministry or accept the calling into the ministry? Well, I never really wanted to hear it. Uh, I, that was, uh, 
uh, even though my grandfather always called me preacher, uh, I, I, I didn't want to hear it. Now, I couldn't get upset with him for calling me preacher, but when I got around here and different people wanted to uh, say, uh, I think you're going to be a preacher, I, I would get uh, a little uptight with him about it. And uh, But I, it had, my sister said that uh, I had been preaching all along. She said that I, when I was in the South and a little fella, I used to preach to the chickens and so <laughs> forth. And, uh, I didn't remember, maybe I did, but anyway, uh, I think uh, in the late 40s, the early 50s, mm -hmm. uh, I used to sing in the choir and I would sort of get carried away with the song. Mm -hmm. And and some thought in my singing you could unwind. Mm, okay. So for uh oh, for in the fifties, uh uh I I wind up with a nervous stomach and uh and the doctor he gave me so many different things and he gave one day he said, uh John, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know what else. Try this, and uh, I took the pill, and it, it was a combination, uh, it, it, and it helped me some. Okay. But uh, uh, maybe a year or so later, uh, I went to him after I had decided I was gonna have to preach. Uh, I went to him. Well, maybe I should say this. I gave in and I said I was going to preach. I went home. I was telling the wife about it, and she said, "I don't want no preacher. I don't want no preacher." <laughs> so I went back to work the next day. I said, "I'm not going." <laughs> <laughs> and I went about a year Did you, after after that. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. I went by a year, and 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 what what is so uh, unusual about it is something that presses you, and especially if you're around the church and you're doing things. Uh, and, uh, and I was leading devotion. Well, I got up with the deacon to help him lead devotion for a meeting. And uh, you're supposed to either sing, whoever sang, sang the uh, song, uh, the other one would pray. Mm -hmm. And then when they finished praying, uh, the one was saying, no, sang a song, scripture, uh, sang a song and pray. Mm -hmm. And then when you finish, you sang another song. And I didn't either. Why? Uh, I was just out of it. it it's, it's something precious. You, I got locked in on uh, call to preach and I, 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 I just couldn't do anything. And so uh, Deacon Sampson did uh, all of it. Sung a song, read scripture, prayed, and then sung another song. And I said, he said, aren't you going to do something? Would you turn it over to the pastor? And I got up and, well, in fact, we were standing, and I said, I'm called to preach. And that's how I announced it. Is that right? Yeah. I wasn't intending to. But when the Spirit is, is in you, yes, when the Lord it, takes it, over, it happens. It takes over, yes. Okay. And then... Uh, I went home and told her, well, my wife and I might have been at the meeting. They knew about it. She didn't, from then on, she was ready. She was ready. Also. Oh, yeah. Well, let's go back. How did she meet you? What is your wife's name, and how did you meet your wife? Well, we were at church. Uh, uh, she had joined our church, uh, I don't know, a few months. And uh, Brother McDaniel, we, uh, we was over to Mount Zion. Uh, we used to go over there in church, the pastor's anniversary. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Reverend Stevenson had preached. And when service was over, uh, I had been sort of watching over uh, for a few few months maybe. Say again? I probably had been watching her for a few months. <laughs> and uh, w we got outside and uh, I said, uh, Brother Mac, uh, do you know uh, the young lady's name? 
uh, and uh, he says, uh, he told me her name, Bernice uh, Thompson, and he says, uh, anyway, she had asked me about you. I said, oh, uh -oh. yeah. I said, well, uh, I, I, I need a phone number. He said, okay. So I think he got a phone number. Uh, either that or I found it when I knew all the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I called her. And uh, it started from there. And mm -hmm. the gran grandmother said, oh, no, not John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, my grandmother and my mother was telling me that, that you know, that the grandma in my heart, Davis, wasn't going to go along with it. Uh, she's young and, you know, you grown. But anyway, uh, I said, well, I don't care what my mother said. I don't care what she said. This is the full, full Sunday in February and uh, okay. in April. Now what now? April we were married. Say it again. This was the fourth Sunday in February. February. Right. Okay. And of 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, April of 1950. April the 6th of 1950, we were married. So that was less than a month. Well, it was a, it, 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 it was a month, something like that. What? February, March, March. April. April. So yeah. a little more than a month. Yeah. Just a fraction. You must have really turned the charm on or something. Well, yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Dog. And she, so, she, you, so you... She, you she, she stopped my thoughts. And got your heart. Yeah. Okay. 59 years ago. 59. So it's been 59 years since you've been married. Uh, this past April. Wow. Well, congratulations to you. I, I, um, well, this goes to show you don't have to have that super long courtship. If Not you know, really. If it's the right one. Right. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so, do you all have any children? Three. Three sons. Okay. Three sons. Derek, Jeffrey, and Tracy. Okay. Any grandchildren? Yes. Uh, five. Okay. Great grands? No. No, no great children. No, don't, don't put, don't, put, <laughs> don't add to it. <laughs> it's great. The grandchildren is enough for a while. Okay, okay. Right. Let's go back a little bit, though, before we move okay. too, too far ahead. Um, we, when you arrived to Toledo, and we're talking about the early years now, um, what was Door Street like? Uh, Door Street was kind of a, a, a busy area. You wasn't allowed you weren't allowed to be playing around on door too much. Okay. It was uh, an area that you had to be kind of, uh, what's the word? Uh, you just weren't allowed to do too much. It's be careful. Yeah, that's, okay. that's a good word. Okay. Careful, be careful. Okay. Uh, in fact, a lot of areas over there were what they used to be. Oh, okay. boy. Okay. But I didn't know that, you know, I, I just adjusted mainly to what was going on because of the fact uh, it wasn't, you know, up until the 60s, it wasn't a whole lot said. We just accepted things, basically. Okay. The, the six, we we accepted uh, a lot of things. In fact, about it a little. No, it was nerve wracking with some of the things that were going on in the sixties because we had never been used to uh, uh, some of the things that okay. the youngsters were doing. Okay, okay. Let me go back to to your ministry. Um, once you accepted the calling uh, yes. to, to preach, what was your first church that you were assigned to? First church. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't assigned to no church. Okay. Uh, uh, when I accepted my calling, uh, I got a chance to preach uh, one night, and then I had to preach the next Sunday night, and then from then on, it was preach, preach, preach. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think I had to preach about 46 times the first year. Wow. Pastors don't preach that many times. <laughs> and uh, uh, I won't go into why I had to preach so much. You don't want to hear that, do you? If, yeah, I'd love to hear it if you, yeah. No, I don't think I, <laughs> I, don't think I want, <laughs> want to tell. Uh, the, 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 if you have to preach too much, you can run out. Uh, if you do be well, it could be that someone wants you to run out. Mm. That's a w nice way to put it. Okay, okay. Yeah. But okay. I was blessed. And okay. I'd been in church all my life. Okay, okay. I'd been around. I could tell a few st stories of the Bible, uh, but uh, after... Mm, I taught preaching in 62, and I got called to the church that I grew up in. And that was unusual here in this city, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, back then, I didn't know young preachers hardly get called no church. Not in that day and time. Why was that? Well, uh, I think people didn't think they had the experience and, and uh, how you gonna pass and, uh, you know, they, they wasn't, they didn't associate with learning as you go. They, they, they were more, uh, and, and, and the older ones had it sold up anyway. Okay, okay. Uh, well, you know, but today though, there seems to be a different trend. There are oh, a lot yeah. of young pastors right. who maybe the first church, they just sort of start their own church. Yes. Uh, which is like different from how it used to be then. Well, a lot of them is getting churches though from the older pastors who uh, has gone on or retired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. But uh, I got called, and after about a year, uh, not a year, but two years. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of sensitive of repeating uh, sermons. Mm -hmm. So then I wanted to, uh, I really want to have a way of being able to uh, come up with more data on sermons. And, and uh, I didn't, I wanted to go to school, but wasn't no Bible college here. And then I had children and I, I wasn't the type to just drop everything, job and all, and go to where school was. I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lord sent to lead a Bible college here, and they set up a school. And, uh, and I wind up, I was in a meeting one night uh, with a group of pastors and preachers, and uh, uh, Pastor I.J. Johnson came down and uh, to the meeting and he said, I can prove that you can go to heaven without works. And he turned the meeting out. We went to looking for Bibles and <laughs> back then you wasn't, uh, people wasn't carrying Bibles like they do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got some Bibles and it was 1 Corinthians 3.15 was dealing with if a man's works be burnt up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so is by fire. And he read, he said, I've been preaching that wrong. <laughs> And, uh, and we wanted to know where did he get it from. Yeah. He said, Toledo Bible College. And I said, he said, oh, where's that at? Downtown in the Y. So I'd been doing a little studying, uh, you know, corresponding courses out mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. out of uh, Dayton. Or was it Cincinnati? I believe it was Cincinnati, Standard Bible College. Anyway, I went in and I said, well, I'm going down here and see what it's all about. Yeah. And I found out that it was interesting. Okay. And that's how I got started. And I just went for, I just wanted a teaching certificate. Okay. And I wind up with a Bachelor of Art, a Bachelor of Religious Education. And that sort of okay. changed my ministry. Did it really? Oh, yes, it changed my ministry. 
at the church or in our, especially the, the five major doctrines, condemnation, com condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification, dedication. Uh, once I started teaching that, that gave us the inroad to uh, not only uh, salvation, eternal security, things of that nature. It really set up a system uh, here that we was uh, was ahead of so many. In fact, I told them we'd be ahead of the regular Baptist church about 10 or 15 years. And it, 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 it just really changed the life. Can you be a, a, an effective Baptist preacher without having education? Uh, not when you say education, to what extent? Without having a, without going to a Bible college like, like, like you did. Well, uh, yes, you can be effective uh, if you do a lot of study. It, it, it's, it's uh, this day and time, uh, you must study uh, because if you don't, the parishioners will know more about it than you. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit can work with you, but it basically works with what you allow it to do. If you don't study, then it's not going to have that much to work with. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't have to go to a Bible college uh, to, to be educated. Sure, sure. Uh, fact about it, our first pastor, uh, the one who organized the church, uh, uh, Reverend W. J. Stevenson. Uh, I don't know totally what his schooling was, but he was—he probably was a doctor. And his it's insight, and and he—he uh, he really, he was so far ahead. I saw some of his sermons after I started preaching, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, oh, "Goodness, what does this mean?" Well, but people have said that you that your sermons are, you know, so profound that they're so forward-looking that you've been dubbed the dean of, of pastors here in Toledo. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, I need to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't think so. Well, you'd be in front. You, I don't I don't I don't think so. You'd be very humble, but I, I, I but think, think so. the, the point is though you, you you that your sermons. And your your visions, you're always looking, you're always forward looking, and I think for that reason, people respect you um, because of your your abilities. That's that's the point I'm making here. Well, I I, I don't know. I, I I try. In fact, when we came along, it said you try to do your best in whatever you do, and if you do your best, uh, you will wind up uh, being uh, okay. Okay, and you have done definitely okay. Well, I guess I think I, you have. Yeah. I think you have. Uh, okay, let, let's go back. So, so uh, as you were in Toledo, um, what, what kind of out, outside of church? Outside of church, what okay. kind of social activities did you and your wife engage in? Uh, social activity. Mm -hmm. Social. Well. I, I've been involved in uh, a lot of things that go on in the city. Okay. Uh, and the wife, uh, she support, have supported me over the years. Fact about it, I need to say this. She pushed me into uh, not only going to Bible college, but getting degrees. Really? Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't forget that. She pushed me in that area because, see, back when I was doing that, uh, they wasn't con uh, they wasn't considering school preachers. They were just uh, if a preacher could uh, say a little something and had a pretty good tune, mm -hmm. they called him. So, if, so it's a term hooping. What, what does it mean to, to, for a preacher? Now to be you able to said hoop? hooping. I, I, that, that's I my said, term. I said tune. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
Th that meant they would sound good. Like you got a song that has a rhythmatizing sound. And if they could do that, they'd get a church. And, uh, but what she was concerned about was uh, there was going to be a time uh, that uh, education, uh, uh, like computer, it, 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 this was going to be uh, uh, air where that uh, knowledge was going to be the forefront mm. of anything you could come up with mostly. Sure. And uh, it would be good if you have uh, something on the wall because uh, we were discussing it uh, that see I was pastoring she was discussing it where that if someone come to visit you or come around they, 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 they're not going to be looking at your desk That's right. when they walk in they go to looking around to see what's on the wall where I, and so uh, she said, well, I think you should go ahead on and, and, oh. and get a degree. And, and then after I did, I, what really uh, uh, sort of got me, I, I, I thought I was doing pretty good because there wasn't a lot of us uh, who had degrees that were past them. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I had quite a few friends, but they were non-pastors that was in school together. We were in school together. Okay. And, uh, uh, and then when I, I had a bachelor, and and they weren't even considering them. It's 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 uh, masters. I said, oh my goodness, I'm putting in all this time, <laughs> and they still they're not studying about <laughs> bachelor. Yeah, and so. Uh, I flew around and wind up saying, uh, one of the schools talked me into studying for a master's. And he said, well, you do that. Uh, you can write three books and you have a doctorate. Why don't you just do that? So, but my wife was the one who pushed that. It's also she was very encouraging then. Right. In fact, uh, she have a degree and uh, she have a bachelor in uh, ministering. She's not a preacher, but she has a degree in it. Is she really? Okay, yeah. awesome. Let's talk a little bit about Indiana Missionary Baptist Church. How big was the church when you first uh, took the church as a minister? Uh, I think they had about 50 or 60, something like that, members. Okay. okay. Yeah. And the church has grown now, and you have to several thousands, I understand it, on, on your roll. Is that correct? Well, uh, quite a few thousand. I probably don't know where I'll sell a thousand at. <laughs> <laughs> but you have I'm serious about that. Uh, I, I, uh, you know, it's hard to keep up with members. And I tried to set it up in the 80s when we built our ground level. I, I really tried to set it up with the officers. I wanted a, a deacon and his wife uh, to have about 75 to 100 members and they make them families. Mm -hmm. Because if you didn't do that, then you're going to get where that we won't know where, the, where they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, I think, about 15 or 16 deacons at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and same as trustees. And I want the deacons to be in the area of counseling and the trustees in the area of budgeting. Uh, they, if they members needed that and then then I give a preacher and his wife so many de deacons and so many trustees to work with and uh, that never really uh, full blossom and so that's why we don't know where okay. uh, you could have a person join church today and uh, uh, next week you try to find them you don't know where they are <laughs> uh, because their phone number changed they've moved and and so so uh, now I do, uh, I do know where 
most of them are if they get sick, get in, you know, be in the hospital, jail, or death. Do you go visit? Yes. Yes. Why is that important? Uh, they, they need uh, the assurance that the pastor is with them and also they think that we can reach God special. They, they think they can reach him, but they think that we have a, a special, we're not Jesus, but they think we can get Jesus to do a little more than some of the other. Okay. Uh, in fact, about it, uh, though, those of us who do not go, uh, you see some sad people walking the car. Uh, another thing is they have ventilators now, and they had them, they've had them for years mm -hmm. in the hospital. And, they, and the ventilator work, uh, uh, it, it, it help organs, how, how you would help rather than force organs. Sure, sure. It, they help organs to function. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and parishioners need the pastor to be there to maybe help them on have an insight of, of uh, decisions that they have to make a lot of time concerning the ventilator. Uh, a lot of people think if you take them off the ventilator, they would be taking that person's life. Well, if we know enough about uh, the body, uh, know enough about the organ, know enough about the medical side, then we can share with them uh, that uh, if this organ is in this shape, uh, the pressure is in this shape, if they have to do uh, give shots to keep the blood pressure, uh, then that meant that there can be enough things wrong with the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, uh, the blood pressure, things of that nature, uh, the brain. It can be enough things wrong that you really wouldn't be doing anything but taking, the person is gone, you can, you know, if you know enough about it, you yeah. can tell where they're going or not. Sure. So then the, the pastor's role then is much larger than on Sunday. Yes, in, in fact about it, this day and time, the pastor need to know something about not only the, the medical side, he need to know something about the judge downtown. Mm -hmm. the judge side. He need to know something about law. Uh, he need to know something about psychology and psychiatry. He need to know something about it because of the fact that there's so much going on that we, uh, if, if you don't know it, then your parishioners is going to have a hard time trying to cope mm -hmm. with society. In fact, I was going to ask you the question, you know, what makes, how, do you, how have you managed to grow your church the way that you have? Um, so, and so what's the key to being a good, a good pastor? One of the, the main thing that helped us to grow was I start teaching uh, the five major doctrines. If you, if, you, if you get the five major doctrine in perspective, then you wind up, if you can get some people who like to uh, love the church, love studying, love the Bible, love people. If you can get some people who uh, love those things and, and, uh, and you teach them the plan of salvation and they will go out and present the plan to sinners, even some Christians uh, that not sure that they are saved. You present the plan to them and I, I, run, I had uh, that going in our mm -hmm. church, and it was kind of a new thing. Well, it wasn't no kind of a real new thing. Okay. And we had some people excited about it. And then my son, uh, the oldest boy, Derek, he went to Bowling Green State University, and he used to get the students to come and visit us. Mm -hmm. And we had a thing going, and, and uh, it was, uh, so then they would go talk to others and then we wind up with a lot of students 
okay. graduate from Bowling Green State who stayed in the city and so forth. And, and uh, they went out and they put it in. See, if you really want a church to grow, you got to have people to really go out and, and tell. It's sort of like uh, people who put on parties mm -hmm. and uh, they, the next day they go on the job or go out in the street, they say, oh, you should have been there. You missed it. You missed it. <laughs> you missed it. It's, uh, we had a glorious time. Uh, but the, one of the things we did not do, though, we didn't go out and try to pull folks out of other churches. That's why I don't know where a lot of them are at. A lot of, they took because we brought in a lot of folks from out in the street and they're not church, church. Okay. Uh, if, but you see, people come from other churches, a lot of them go to church. They might get dissatisfied where they're at, but they will go to church. Okay. Yeah. How do you, is, is a pastor's role to be a manager of a church? I mean, you have people, do you have a management style, and do you, are you, you do this, you do that, or do you allow people to do what they do best? I, uh, when we was, uh, when I was in Bible college, uh, they shared with us that y you're going to have to have managing, administrating skills. If you do not have them, uh, then should I tell you what they said that would happen to the past? I wish you would, absolutely. Well, in some churches, the trustee would take it. <laughs> the deacons would run it. <laughs> if you don't have those skills. Uh, see, uh, where, where I was, uh, Reverend Stevenson, he, he, he was a preacher, and he, he could preach, but he didn't, he wasn't an administrator. He had a trustee that did, and I was a part of it, but I didn't try to run anything. I was secretary of the trustee board. But what happened was when I started pastoring, uh, I, I was, have been an administrator too and, and a builder. So you need to know something about administrative work if you're going to build. Okay. If you don't, uh, then, well, there's a lot of things you can save money on and, you know, it can be tight. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can, if you learn how to stretch the dollars. So, and, and but it's good to have insight on, to pick people. It's too big for us to do by ourselves. And... Uh, and it's good to have people who will do and can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm not the type to uh, what you call ride roughshod. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, church is more of a, of a love, uh, uh, forgiving, uh, understanding. You, you have to have that spirit. Now, I have a few that who love to deal with the administrative side uh, in the business uh, like you do in the secular field. And, uh, but we, we're supposed to have a better spirit. Than <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can, okay. I've been blessed to have some uh, good people, people with skills, uh, a lot of educated folks. Sure, sure. Uh, we've had a lot of teachers, a lot of business folks, and so forth. Okay. Okay. And, and, and if you can get them to accept the Lord and really accept the fact that uh, the pastor should have the last say about a thing, and if you try to be up to date on it, you, you don't have that much problem. Okay. Okay. Well, obviously, you've done something well. I mean, because you you you're surviving. Your church continues to. The to Holy grow. Spirit has done something. The Holy Spirit well, has done something yeah, through you. Well, through me. Yeah. Through you. Yeah, He's been nice to me. I've been blessed to have some good people, and the devil probably hear this, and he tell the demon, "Say, well, create a problem before <laughs> before you get home." <laughs> Uh, you okay. do know that he can create problems. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Okay, good, Pastor. Well, is it, you know, do you, I mean, I know that you're, you, you've been pastoring for a good number of years now. Forty-four. Forty-four years. Yes. Any plans to retire? 
I, I don't want to, I wouldn't discuss that uh, because of the fact that that could create a problem. Okay. I know some have uh, uh, mentioned that and then they changed their mind and then there were those who had their wagon, uh, determined a wagon, got their folks together <laughs> and then said, oh yeah, you said it, so uh, we want it to happen. And, uh, but no, I don't discuss that. In fact, about it, I tell the pastors, don't be talking about when you're going to retire, wait until you get ready to do it and then do it. Uh, don't tell them ahead of time. Just do it. Just do it. Okay. Make sure. And then another thing, make sure the Holy Spirit is telling you what to do about it. See, and, and I was sharing with you earlier that the Holy Spirit uh, has uh, blessed us and uh, uh, blessed in Ann Avenue Baptist Church because uh, he, he it, it's a lot of people building churches and been building them now for a few years. But when we came along, it wasn't either. Mm -hmm. You really had to pinch your pennies. And uh, in fact, uh, he designed our church, the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yeah. Every architect that I had got upset with us. Is that right? Yeah. But uh, okay, good. we've been blessed. Okay, good. Well, again, I think you, again, I think that you are one, you're highly respected in the community. And thank you so much, Pastor, for agreeing to have this conversation with me. Um, so much appreciated. Um, and I look forward to seeing many more years of you in the pulpit. Well, hopeful. Uh, my dad reached 100, but uh, at 82, uh, my body said no. We'll <laughs> let the Holy Spirit make, the, make, make that call. Let him make the Make decision. that call. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate right. it. God bless you.